Today, it's a little bit different because it's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a week before Jesus resurrected from the dead. And in order for us to understand the significance of some of the things that happen in the text that we're about to read, revolve around Palm Sunday, we have to understand that there was a prophecy that the Israelites were aware of. There was a prophecy spoken by the prophet Zechariah that said that Israel's king would enter into Jerusalem riding on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. That that would signal the entrance of their king into the capital and that great things were about to happen. All right. The reason that that's relevant is if that's not in the back of our mind, it's kind of awkward. Like, okay, why did Jesus so carefully plan out the things that we're about to read that he planned out? Okay. So we have to realize that Israelites were expecting a big thing to happen when their king rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. So we got that. We got that little cultural expectation out of the way to be thinking about. The other thing, there was a lot of debate about who Jesus was and about if he was this king that they're waiting for, what that king would do and what he would be like. So there's a lot of hustle and bustle and excitement around Jerusalem already because Jesus is showing up and Jesus is a pretty controversial figure that's doing a lot of awesome things. But then here's the last thing we got to realize. Jerusalem was nuts. Bigger than race week at Martinsville. Okay? It was huge. Because they were entering into Jerusalem preparing for the Passover festival. The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover festival were Jewish holidays holidays that God told them, you must obey my law that says you have to appear before me during these festivals. So they would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and go to the temple buy things to offer sacrifices, make sacrifices, eat the Passover meal. It was a huge festival time because the Day of Atonement and Passover were the two greatest, grandest celebrations of the Jewish nation. And so the context is a busy time, an exciting time, a celebratory time, a crowded time. And then Jesus shows up in the middle of it. And as he shows up, there's huge crowds of people that are already kind of on edge because everything that's happening in controversial Jesus shows up and he knows that people have this mindset of how their king will enter into Jerusalem and then watch what he does. This is in Luke chapter 19 verse 28. After Jesus had said this, this is referring back to some parables that he talked about um, just prior to this. After he'd said these things, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Jesus is on purpose sending them to go get a colt, a donkey. And his intent is to get on this donkey and ride it into Jerusalem. Why? He's trying to signal in their mind the prophecy from Zechariah. He wants it to click so that they're like, hey, that prophecy we've heard about, it's happening right now. It is intentional. And Jesus had set this up. He'd planned for this to happen. He wants to enter into Jerusalem in this way. And we keep reading says, those who were sent ahead of him went and found it just as he told them. We're going to stop again. They found it just as he told them. You know, Jesus was fully aware that when these people showed up, that they would find a donkey tied up and that somebody would probably say, what are you doing? And they were supposed to say the Lord needs it. Then they let him go. None of that caught Jesus by surprise. He knew that that was going to happen. But he also knew that when he got on that donkey and he entered in Jerusalem, it didn't end with a donkey ride in Jerusalem. He knew it ended at the cross. He knew what was about to happen. He knew how he would be received and later rejected. He knew exactly what he was getting into. None of this caught him by surprise. The people showed up, found it exactly as Jesus had said, because Jesus knew what he was getting into. And, and I just want to make a brief aside point about that. So many times we look at our lives and the circumstances in our lives and the things that we're dealing with, and it feels out of our control, because it is. 
It's bigger than us. It's more complicated than us. It's confusing. We can't wrap our heads around it. We don't want to have to go through it. And it catches us by surprise a lot of times. But it does not catch our Lord by surprise. He knows. He is not surprised. He does not get snuck up on. We find things surprising to us but Jesus knows what he's getting into here and when he walks with us and we're walking with him we can have the confidence of knowing when he goes with us he knows what he's dealing with he is competent and qualified to deal with the things that we're dealing with they found things exactly as Jesus had told them we're going to keep reading now Verse 33, as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As they went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Now we've got to talk a little bit about, uh, who here owns a cloak? We've got to talk about cloaks. Yeah, we don't wear cloaks. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen anybody wear a cloak. They're just not what we do anymore. But in Palestine, in Jerusalem, what was customary is you wore two robes, so to speak. One was your under robe. It was very thin against the skin, more or less your undergarment. Then over that you had your cloak, your overcloak. It was the nicer, more, vis- more visibly pleasant thing. You know, if you were wealthy enough, you get the best cloak that you had. Okay, And this was festival time. It was holiday time. So you took the best cloak that you had to go to Jerusalem to worship. And so they had these cloaks on themselves preparing to go to the temple. And they were all in celebratory mode. It's a holiday. It's a festival. And they take these cloaks off, some of which were probably pretty valuable. For others, it may not have been valuable, but it was the only cloak they had. And they took it and they set it on a donkey for Jesus to sit on. And then think about this visual. There's this huge crowd of people taking off their cloaks and they're in their thin under cloak. And then they get their cloak and they lay it on the ground so this dirty donkey can trample over it. Get it all muddy and all nasty. Paving the way for Jesus. Let's let that sink in a little bit, because it's easy to read that, and since we don't dress this way, we don't get the significance of it. But these people were humbling themselves, and they were like, I, what I have right now, I got this cloak, it's nice. I'm laying it down to Jesus because He's worth it. And that's what's going on here. And then more than, oh, these poor palm things. I'm going to just do this real quick. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, So they put their cloaks on the road. Verse 37. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Jesus designed this whole thing to point to the fact that He was the king who was showing up. And they put two and two together because they knew their Bible. And they said, the king is here. And so they announced, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And they throw their garments down. Palm branches are not mentioned in Luke, oddly enough. But we know there were palm branches from the other gospel writers. We're not going to talk about why Luke didn't do it. But he intentionally left it out because of who he was writing to. Anyhow... There were palm branches and they were waving those and they were making a big deal out of all this because they wanted to give glory and respect to God because the King Jesus had showed up. And they were celebrating Jesus is the King, God's King, the Messiah. He has shown up. They were okay with Jesus being the King because at this point they didn't grasp what it meant for him to be King, what kind of King he had decided he was going to be. An interesting point, we're going to get a little bit more to this later. Interestingly, a large number of these people that are doing this very thing are the same people that on Good Friday are yelling, crucify him. That's kind of humbling to think about, isn't it? It's easy to embrace concepts of Jesus so long as he meets our expectation. But to follow Jesus for his own sake, sometimes I don't want that crucifying. 
And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But they are worshiping God. They are celebrating who Jesus is. They are giving the best that they got. They're all excited, giving Jesus honor. And then catch what the Pharisees do. Some of the Pharisees, this is verse 39, in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now what's a Pharisee? Uh, just to kind of cover, make sure we're on the same page. Jews of this period, just like Christianity is today, they were split into denominations. They were different sects of Jews. The Pharisees were one of the largest sects of the Jews of this period. Very strict. They held a very high regard for Scripture. They did their best to live for God, so much so that they set up traditions around God's laws. They were so afraid of breaking God's law, they made sub-laws to ensure they never broke the actual law. I mean, they were die hard in their religion. They really, really were die hard in their religion. And because of that, when the person, Jesus, shows up, they rejected Him. Now think about that. Why did they reject Jesus, when He shows up. They were at Jerusalem during Passover. They were at the right place at the right time. We've covered this many times. I know Dave's talked about it. I've talked about it. So many times we do religion and religious stuff and we equate it with a relationship with God. That's not a necessary corollary. They were so religious, they missed, up the, they missed the God they were supposed to be worshiping when He actually showed up. And instead of worshiping the God they claim to be serving, they're telling His followers, make them shut up. Make them stop. They should not be honoring you in this way. And then Jesus, you got to love His response. He says, look at the next verse. I tell you, He replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. If I make my followers stop giving me honor, all of creation will scream out glory to me and to the Father. Why? Because creation knows its creator. And when he shows up, all creation groans. All creation responds in adoration and glory and awe. And Jesus said what they are doing when they are laying their cloaks down, waving palm branches, when they are singing praise to God and they're all excited, that is the only proper response to me. Anything less than that is dry and stale and dead religion. And because you're so obsessed with your religion, you miss the living God among you. We've got to be so careful not to submit to the form of religion and miss the substance of the person of Jesus Christ. It's what the Pharisees did. Right place, right time, right rules but left God out of the equation because they missed Him when He showed up. I want to keep going. As He approached Jerusalem and saw the city, He wept over it. Now it is easy to breeze past that word wept. Some translations say He mourned over it. The word there is actually He, he sobbed violently. He is all tore up about this. He is visibly upset and he is you know, weeping, breathing heavy over Jerusalem. And he said, if you, even you, had only know on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the King of Peace, shows up peacefully riding on a donkey, which is a symbol of peace in the ancient world. And He offers peace. He says, if you'd have recognized what was happening, even you, as hostile that you've been towards Me, even you could have peace with God, but you did not recognize it because it was hidden from your eyes. See, they were so blinded by what they cared about that they missed Jesus in their midst. They missed the God who came to be with them. And it's real easy for us to be pretty hard on the Pharisees. How did, how did they do this? How in the world could these, poss these people possibly be there with Jesus, God in the flesh, and miss His coming? 
But see, this isn't recorded in the Bible for us to be like, those stupid Pharisees. No, that that's, misses the point. Neither, and this is a thing we do so often, neither is it for me to be like, man, I hope my wife heard that. I'm not talking about my wife, of course. <laughs> but you know, so often we think the Scriptures are for anybody but us. But the challenge here is for us to ask ourselves, what is it that the Pharisees were missing? What is it they cared so much about that they were on fire for all the wrong thing and they missed Jesus in their presence? We have to evaluate our own heart constantly and say, God, is there anything that I am pursuing and setting up that's not you, that is blinding me from you in my life? Sometimes the things that blind us are good things. Just like the Pharisees. It was good to go to the temple because God commanded them to do it. It was good to offer sacrifices. It was good to memorize the scriptures. It was good to live rigorous moral lives. All of that was good. But they had set those things up and they had missed the God that all those things were supposed to be pointing to. They were building their own interests, building their own religion. Religion doesn't save you. Being religious doesn't mean squat. Jesus makes all the difference. And that's what Jesus is calling people to. He's like, you and your religion miss the point. It's about me, the living Christ. I'm going to be careful how I say this, but churches fall into this trap a lot because so often we miss the boat. We miss the point because we think our main goal is to get more people in our church, to build our membership, to swell the number of people sitting here and to get giving to go up or all those things. Bad? No. But they're not the main thing. You see, the main thing is pointing people to the living Christ. We have to be a community that Christ reigns in as king. And our focus has to be on following Christ, knowing Christ, and submitting to Christ as king. And it's so easy to get religious busyness. And since it happens at church, it must be good, right? We get distracted from the main point. See, if we follow Jesus and we submit to the kingship of Jesus, growth happens. Because people are attracted to Jesus, but we better not ever dare to be like the Pharisees and be like, well, you know, if you join us, Jesus will come along the way. And it doesn't work like that. We have to be completely focused on Jesus and make the pursuit and submission to Jesus the main thing. Sometimes it can be a good thing. Sometimes it can be things that shouldn't be in our lives anyways, but we do not want to relinquish control of it. Jesus shows up as king. The Pharisees did not want him to be king. And so often we have this mindset. We're like, okay, God, I've got my life and what I'm doing and what my goals are, but this area of my life, you can have it. That's the hour on Sunday and a few service things that I do. But then beyond that, it's mine. And we act Jesus like he's some kind of, we act like Jesus is some kind of add on to our goals and our ambitions. Jesus says, no, that's not how it works. I'm the king. That means that everything in your life is oriented under my kingship. You submit to me fully and completely in every way. There is no salvation apart from that. It is only through the peace that Jesus can make that we have salvation. See, the Pharisees didn't like Jesus because he was claiming to be the king, the Messiah, and made himself equal with God, his father. They couldn't swallow that. But we who follow Jesus grasp that to be true. To come to Jesus is to accept Jesus as king. And to accept the peace that God offers through Jesus. I mean, he says it right here. He's like, look, you could have had peace had you, accept, had you accepted my kingship. I'm going to go on. Verse 43, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is very specific prophecy. Jesus said this around A.D. 30-ish. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman general Titus in A.D. 70, about 40 years later, about a generation later. And it was completely razed and destroyed 
one stone taken off the other, reduced to a pile of rubble, just like Jesus said. They were surrounded and they were destroyed. The reason given, because you did not recognize the, the visitation, the time of God's coming to you. I showed up to save you. I showed up to offer you peace. I extended salvation for you. But you were blinded because you put other things in place of me. You see, what happened to Jerusalem is a picture. The, the Bible does this a lot. It uses um, historical events or practices or certain um, people as types is what it's called. It's a prophecy, but not with words. It's by action or by events. Things that happen that foreshadow something bigger in the future. What happened to Jerusalem is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen on a cosmic scale. This word visitation, the time of God's coming to you. In some, translation, in some translations it says, you did not recognize the time of your God's visitation. It's the exact same word that is used sometimes to refer to Jesus' second coming. Jesus refers here to His first coming. He said, I showed up. I'm your God. I've come to save you. The Creator was not recognized by that which He created. He offered peace, but they didn't want to hear it. They wanted something less than the person of Jesus. They wanted a religion of systems and of controls and of, of things that were set up that they felt was measurable and containable. They didn't want the live and breathe and active Son of God. They didn't recognize it. And even though God on His end shows up where they were to redeem, to redeem them, offers peace, begs them to be saved... They were so blinded they wouldn't accept it. And in this visitation, 40 years later, it being rejected, those that did not accept Christ received the judgment. And on a grand scale, what we have to realize is that Jesus is coming again. And there's a time interval between when He went back into heaven and when He comes again, His second visitation. And He is extending peace to all people. The King of Peace came and He offers peace. Because God desires us to be in His family. God desires our salvation. And He did everything that needed to be done to save us. He took everything that kept us from God and He took it to a cross and it died with Him and was put into a grave. And all those that accept God's call for peace are joined to Jesus' death in His burial and His resurrection. And that is how we become saved. We accept peace with God through what Jesus did. Now is the time of God's visitation. He's come and He is present through His church, through the Holy Spirit. And our responsibility is to continue this plea and this call for peace and accept Jesus as King. We go back and we look at the reaction of His followers. That has to be our reaction. We know Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. We have accepted Him as King of our lives. And we know that it's only by accepting Jesus as King that we have peace with God. And when we do that, it changes us. It transforms us. We get a new focus and a new perspective in life. And we worship God. We give of ourselves to God. There's a challenge for us to think about. If we go to this challenge, it's simply this. Remember those cloaks that those people were throwing on the ground? What cloak... Do we need to lay down for King Jesus? If we accept Jesus as King, our reaction should be like those that accepted Him as King. As He entered into Jerusalem, they had these, these cloaks. They were nice. They're outer covering. They took it off and laid it to be trampled. So here's the thing for us to think about. What thing do I hold on to that I cover myself with because it's comfortable, because I like it, because it's nice, because I worked hard to get it, because it's so much a part of me? What thing is it that I'm holding on to that I need to say, Jesus, if you're going to be King, I need to lay all this down before you. What do I need to take off and lay down? Because to follow Jesus as King means just that. But so often we want to be like the Pharisees and cling to our cloak and cling to our dry religion and treat Jesus as an add-on to our already busy life, going the direction we want it to go. Jesus says it doesn't work that way. 
You've got to lay down your cloak. Maybe it's an attitude that needs to be laid down. Maybe it's the way that we treat somebody. Maybe it's ex- uh, forgiveness we have to extend. Maybe it's the example that we leave to our children. Maybe it's taking a more active role in leading our family to know Jesus. Maybe it's taking steps to serve a neighbor. Maybe it's getting involved in a way to help serve somebody in the community. Maybe it's something huge because Jesus is not beyond asking us to do big things. He told one guy that was rich, sell everything you got, give money to the poor and come follow me. Could be that. But whatever cloak it is that maybe we're holding on to, we have to ask ourselves, Lord God, Jesus, you are king. What must I lay at your feet? And we'll find if we're honest and introspective when we look in, the Spirit will show, I got on a few cloaks. I need to work on laying them at the feet of Jesus. And so that's our challenge for us to think about as we move forward. Jesus calls us to wholehearted, single-minded obedience and acceptance of his kingship God offers us peace through Jesus Christ and those of us that have already received that that peace and we're already walking with God he gives us grace day by day to live more fully with him and see as the world sees God's people laying their cloaks down changing being transformed worshiping, proclaiming Jesus is King and giving glory to God for that, it brings them to a point of decision and clarity. Either they will be as those that lay cloaks and give glory to God, or they will be as the Pharisees that sit back distantly and say, ah, y'all, that's too much for me. Not doing that. But it is the way that we live, the way that we worship, the way that we submit ourselves and our lives to Jesus that brings people to that moment of clarity and decision. That's what we've been called to do as God's people. What cloak do we need to lay down? We're going to finish up with a song. It's meant to be a song of invitation. It could be that there's somebody here. The cloak that you're wearing is the one that all people before they come to Jesus are wearing. That's the cloak of sin. See, the big issue between us and God is that we have rebelled against God and we have loved things less than God and we have turned against and rebelled against God and we said, I want to be king, God. That's the core nature of sin. It's the same sin that Satan did at the beginning. Thought he could run his life in the world better than God could. When we sin, we do just that. Say, God, I know you said such and such, but I know better. I want to do this. And it's not going to do anything. And God said, no, you don't understand how powerfully destructive and terrible sin is. And when we sin, we are leading full-fledged rebellion against God. But God will forgive that rebellion because he extends peace through Jesus. And he invites us to take that cloak and lay it down. And Jesus tramples it at the foot of the cross and it is gone forever. He died the death that a rebel deserved to die. And he did it because he loves us intensely and deeply. And he rose from the dead to continually make that offer for all people. And if you're at a place where you need to accept Jesus, you need to come and lay down that cloak of your sinfulness, and you need to come and accept Jesus as King, come do so as we sing. Please stand.